Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm great, thanks, Jim. How you doing? I'm doing well. That's good to hear. Is is that sign the right way around for you, or is it back to front? Am I reversed or okay? The sign is perfect. Great. It it uh, and we'll be showcasing <laughs> the same here. By the way, <laughs> oh my goodness, I gotta say your um your brother in law great design approach on the cover of these books. I love the I, look and feel of the book. Yeah, it's, it's my son in law. Yeah, yeah. Son in law. He, sorry. You know, my, my, I was working in London many years ago. My daughter met this young man. He was a student. Uh, they decided to get married. He came up, and I didn't realise quite how gifted he was. In his first year in Scotland, he won Graphic Designer of the Year. Wow. You know, and so, yes. And the thing about this is he said, you know what? Um, I've never done a, a book. I'll do a book and then bang out it came you know and, and I didn't think ahead I was only thinking of one book but there you are three colors set exactly right for uh, for three books yeah yeah you know what Jim just just great by the way I like that really uh, we'll get into it in our little chat here today but I also like just the common sense approach I, oh. I think I think there's really your writing so clear but um, just this common sense approach and I, I actually think there's almost this common sense revolution coming in professional sales. Yes. yes. You know, so, so, so I think all of this would be great fodder for today. By the way, how are things for you and yours? Everybody healthy and safe and all those kind of good things? Um, we're all really good. Um, funnily enough, today, hold on a minute. Ah, I'm doing that the wrong yeah, way. Pull it right? in, yeah. Close yeah, to pull you. it in a bit this way. Oh, my goodness. Right, let me just get back to there. There, yeah, that's better. Um, that looks good. It's, it's been interesting because uh, at nine o'clock yesterday evening, we got back from a week's holiday that had been postponed for a couple of years with COVID uh, to San Diego. Oh, so I am jet lagged to death. But, uh, <laughs> I'm in a waking moment just now, so it's not too bad. Yeah. How was your yes. trip? Do you know what? I, I've worked, as you've seen, I've worked for some of the big players in the US and I spent a lot of time in New York and I must have done about 20, 25 US cities. I've never done San Diego. It's my favorite. Oh, wow. Wow, above, tell me about above that. Above New York for the buzz, above San Francisco, which I've done maybe 15, 20 times. I, I just loved it. And why, Jim? What was different about um, San Diego from somewhere like San very, Francisco? It felt very safe. It okay. felt very relaxed. The people were incredibly friendly. Oh. And, and then, I mean, just the area. I, I, have you been there? I haven't. No, I've been to San no, Fran, right. but I haven't been to San There's Diego. There's an area called La Jolla where literally on the sidewalk, there's a wall. You look over the wall and there are seals, sea lions, etc. Oh. sitting there. I mean, like physically four foot from you, yeah? And it's a seafront with high hills behind. Shocking fact, the highest housing prices in the US, above Fifth Avenue, ab oh, these are just holiday homes where what we would call a flat, I guess you would call a condo with one bedroom is a million. Yeah. Yeah. And then they go up to seven, eight million just wow. in this little confined space. The thing that gave it away for us as we got the Uber, we said, we'll have a day in this place. People said it's good. As we drove down, we passed the McLaren dealership next to the Lamborghini dealership. Of course. And went, okay, right. Now we know where we are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but astoundingly beautiful. Um. The zoos, the best zoo I've ever been to. Just everything was was really, really good. Yeah. Well, well, you you're uh, you and I are of the kind of same generation, so you'll yeah. remember this. You talk about the zoo in the old days on the Tonight Show. Johnny Carson used to have, you know, you'd have the pet guy who came uh -huh. on. Yeah, it was always the leader of the San Diego Zoo. So, so they're known for having he uh, yeah. got the, the, one of the best zoos in the U.S. Yes. The San Diego Zoo. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Well, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, just absolutely, yeah. Couldn't recommend the place highly enough. And of course, it's it's the home of 
the US Navy and the US Marines, and that didn't mean much. We went a bit out of town to a place called Shelter Island, which is just a peninsula. And around the bay from us, directly opposite, was the main US Marines base. So they were very good and very socially aware. Mm. But at five past eight in the morning, the first the first F-18 would take off in the silence. And it was like, the first morning we're... Yeah, no going, kidding. Oh, what's got? Yeah. So it's uh, um, Blackhawks, Ospreys, F-18s, everything on the military paraphernalia going about. Not so loud that it would annoy, but you just kept on seeing these things in the sky. But um, yeah, all in all, astounding place. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. What, how great to hear, by the way. How amazing, yeah, yeah. Uh, amazing to hear. Listen, yeah. um, I'll tell you what, I'm just enjoying this chat so much. We should get started and just continue this chat. Uh, yeah, sure. It, Absolutely. It, so, so, Jim, what we do is, of course, I, I, we do a properly recorded intro, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, with a proper bio. I do it three and four times, so we get it perfect. And then we go, hey, and now into the show. Yes. And so the way we start these is I'll just take a pause here and go, hey, Jim, welcome to the show. Yep. Yep. And then we, we can see wherever this takes us. We were thinking about discovery. Remember, yeah, we yeah. were thinking about talking yeah. about discovery and then leading to your, your, latest, your latest book. Yes. Sure. We can go anywhere you want. And anytime I ask a question, if you want a second to think about it, you can throw anything back to me. And go, that's interesting, Mark. What do you think? Yeah. yeah and yeah. That, give, that gives you a couple of, and at the end, I'll keep an eye on the time for us. And, you know, we'll chat for 30, 40 minutes, whatever seems comfortable. Yeah. And then at the end, I like to throw it over, Jim, say, listen, how do people learn more about you or get in contact with you? Yeah, sure, sure. You know, and all that okay. stuff makes its way into a show notes. Great. Does that sound, Great. sound okay? That sounds absolutely perfect. Yep. Perfect. Okay, we'll just take a pause here for a second. So, um, uh, Krizia, we're just going to start up in a second. Hey, Jim, welcome to the show, and thanks so much for joining today. Hey, great to be with you, Mark. <laughs> I, I'm really looking forward to our chat. So, so we were talking offline, Jim, and you know, you're just back in from a trip to the U.S. Yes. Um, so, where are you coming to us from today? And where was that trip? Okay, well, let's start with the trip first. We went for a, a COVID-delayed holiday, yeah. long planned, to San Diego, which we loved. Can't tell you how much we liked it. Um, and only got back last night. So today will be a quiet day for me. Um, the, where, where am I speaking to you from? Well, you can probably guess by my accent. I'm Scottish. <laughs> Uh, it's not San wife, Diego. From your accent, yeah. you're not originally from San Diego. Let's Absolutely. Yeah, you're so astute, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my wife is from Northern Ireland, and that's where I live now. So I'm living in the country uh, about two miles from the largest lake in Europe, a lake oh. called Loch Ne, and uh, looking out onto the Irish countryside. So it's a lovely place to be. It's a bright sunny day today. And it's actually quite warm, so all is good. Oh, it's beautiful to hear. My, my mum was Irish. Oh, and right. she was Yeah, she was from a small place called Cork. Tiny, tiny little place from called Down Cork. Down at the bottom, yep. Down at the bottom. And a few years back, my brother and his uh, lovely wife were traveling through there. And they popped into this place to have a look. It's the first time any of us had been there. Tiny, tiny little town with, with an, a small number of churches. And when they went into one of the churches, believe it or not, they found, they started speaking to the priest. They found a journal that had baptisms dating back almost a hundred years. Yes, yes. And they found her name and date of the baptism. And, and so, you, it just, it was just awesome. You know, just and yes. they sent me a picture yeah. and it just warmed the heart. Yes. And, and do you know, do you know what's funny? The, the Island of Ireland, which of course is two countries is, um, it's made up of lots of small communities. Dublin is the only large city. Uh, the only city near us is Belfast. But the whole of Northern Ireland, including Belfast, is only about one and a half million people. Wow. And in business, that means that you meet someone and within 30 seconds, they're saying, 
oh, you live there, do you know? And it's, it's like you, you cannot escape. It's a, it's a fantastic environment, but everybody knows somebody who knows you. It's just, yeah, it's incredible. By the way, Jim, what a great lesson. That's a great note. I always talk to, um, you know, the folks that we work with and some of the new salespeople we train. It's yes. hard for people right out of college or university or even, you know, um, right from high school sometimes. It's hard for them to believe that you'll continue to come through, come across the same people in your business career. Oh. And most of my career was spent in North America, a good portion in the US, but, yes. but I am Canadian. And in Canada, when you come back and do work in Canada, it's incredible. You do just keep coming through the same. Yes. People. Yes. So, yes. you know, reputation, character, all these things are so critically important, you know, because it's going to follow you throughout your career. It sounds like it's, you know, even more important in Ireland. In, 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 in Ireland and in Northern Ireland, particularly, the business community is so small that if you do something that's um, irresponsible or improper, that will just follow you for the rest of your career if you have a career. Right. So but start- even in larger communities, you should never forget that. Yeah, the number of people that I meet and then somebody says, oh, I had a boss who worked with you and this is what he said. Right. And it's like, wow, thank goodness. Yes. Right. Take it to the other side. I, you know, a, a client, a customer, a prospect. You know, I think in one of the things we'll get into in our conversation today is, you know, people remaining their authentic self when they're selling. You know, if, if you're new to professional sales and maybe you're in a sales development role and you're getting confused that the conversations are about you instead of the prospect, that's where, that's where I think you have that right to have that conversation with a leader or a manager saying, yes. we have to make sure we understand how we're adding value here instead of just yes, trying to pitch yes. a product. Yes, uh, yes. I, I sense from what you're saying, we're going to agree violently all the way through <laughs> this, but, uh, but let's yeah. carry on. Yeah. That, that's it. Yeah. Now, um, maybe just for the, the, the listeners, Jim, a little bit of a brief history of your journey in professional sales. I've, you know, I've read your book and number one of your three great books, and uh, it's a great story, but tell us a little bit about your background and what you're up to today. Yes. I get shocked every time I say this, but I've had 45 years in sales and it's just a crazy it's amazing. Yeah. I started very young and I was so incredibly fortunate in Europe. Uh, it's, it's all of my career has been in tech and biotech and pharma. Um, the very first company that took me on as a trainee was a company called Olivetti, not known much in North America, but was the second largest technology company in Europe in the 70s. Wow. And they had the old style approach. Before I was let loose on anybody, I had a six week residential training course, sales basics, sales role plays, sales process, which became the foundation for my career. Yeah. Um, I then worked with, with, with tech companies. Um, I was a, a manager with Wang, who were a, a yeah. big company in the old days. They sure were. Um, I was the Scottish manager for a company not a lot of people have heard of, but an incredibly influential company called uh, Amdal. Amdal. Amdal, yeah. Yeah, were IBM's biggest competitor in the mainframe world. And my goodness, was that an education. I walked into accounts, IBM's, uh, and, and IBM at its peaks, most strategic accounts Hmm. with the goal of taking their most important technology away from them. So that took me into the world of political selling, all of that stuff, which was such an education. Um, I finished off my career with with two roles. Uh, One, uh, Silicon Graphics, where I started in Scotland, and then became the head of the channels and partners operation for Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. So I grew that business from, from, from memory from about 85 to about 300 million turnover uh, and worked wow. in about 25 countries, which was just fantastic. Um, so there was a big organization under me, but, but I, I, I loved the process. And then finally, um, I worked for the biggest company that nobody's ever heard of or that anybody's ever heard of called Information Builders. Information Builders, along with Cognos and business objects, they were the big three in business intelligence for corporates. Um, 
that company, I was the UK for the MD, the right. MD for the UK, my goodness. Yep, managing director, yeah. right. Made um, role. And they, they sold to very large corporates, people like uh, British Telecom, et cetera. And so I led a, a large organization in the UK. It was their biggest subsidiary. So I led that for a number of years. And then after a grand total of 30 years, I just left the corporate world and moved into doing my own thing. Great. And that own thing has turned out to be um, training, coaching, and mentoring technology startups. So where, let's say, two people in the university have an idea, they start, they start to build up, but of course, they don't know sales, they don't know commerce, they don't know marketing, so I help. And, and a, slight, a slight note to finish off the introduction, unlike a lot of people in the world of sales, I have actually had two paths. I spent something like eight years in senior marketing roles. Ah. So, I'm, so I'm professionally qualified in marketing. I'm a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Marketing. So when I come to things, I see it with the sales eye, but also with the marketing eye. And uh, that then led me, as you mentioned so kindly, to, to write the books. Uh, three books in two years, which I'm told is quite unusual. It sure and it's is. It's quite hard work. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, it's gone okay. So that's me. I, I think okay is an understatement, but boy, um, Jim, you know, for, for folks out there just listening, your timing was spectacular in terms of your roles in technology with those companies. So, yeah. so you know, one of the things that's so interesting is uh, those companies were all really foundational in terms of what happens today, but they yes. were... What an interesting uh, set of experiences you would have had when you're trying to compete with such a dominant player like uh, IBM. Back in the day, no one wanted to buy anything that wasn't IBM because they didn't, understand, they didn't understand technology and they didn't want to make a mistake. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there was this adage out there that says nobody gets fired for buying IBM and then yeah, you're going yeah. with Amdahl trying yeah. to uh, usurp IBM accounts, they, they were extremely difficult to penetrate. Yes, yes. So, so you know, there's the, I like the um, quote in your book about um, Albert Einstein saying, you know, the teacher is experience. You've had some amazing experiences. Yes, and that's, you know what, you know what, I never think of myself as that smart, but my goodness, the school of life just hammered at me for so many years yeah and when you think of IBM not only was was everything that you said true but they scaled their salespeople and their support and the hardest of all was their biggest enterprise accounts yeah. I, I took one account from them and we had three people in Scotland and the account had 18 IBM staff on site yeah and so you know my goodness yeah wow. so in, interesting process um but then Silicon Graphics and, and the introduction of CGI, everything that we take for granted today came through the, the Silicon Graphics line. So special effects, design, all of that stuff. So yes, I've, I've had a very fortunate career and yeah, it's just been fantastic. You, you know, Jim, one of the things your books, um, first of all, I love your books and, well, and you. you know, I, and I like the approach, which is this very much this kind of common sense approach to selling. So, so just, you know, focusing on the customer, focusing on the team. Uh, I love the, uh, the, the sales leader guide where the focus is on the team and elevating the team. But, but one of the things I think is just so critically important for folks in sales today is a little bit of old is new, new again in professional sales. Yes. And so over the last top, you know, 10 years, We've heard this, this move afoot or 15 years, we're saying, wow, it's a new thing that multiple people influence a decision to move forward with our solution. And, you know, we talk about complex selling and I've got to influence the various different buyers and they've all got personal needs and wants. Yeah. The reality of it is you and I know it's always been that way for big deals. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. You know, if you're doing something like, think of that, IBM had a team of 18 people on the account. Can you only imagine how many people British Telecom was leveraging to make decisions when they're tra talking about replacing major IT systems? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And, and so, and, and I, I sold into BT in, in Scotland successfully. And right. Yes, you, you have to look at the DMU, the decision-making unit, who are all the people who are going to be involved, not only 
you know, there's, there's this great thing that uh, everybody says, oh, you have to get to the top decision maker. Yeah, fantastic. Well, it's so good. But you know what? That's only half the story. That decision maker is schooled and knowledgeable and knows about playing the sales game. They'll tell you what you want to hear. Or they'll tell you nothing else. So I always go high, low. Try right. to get to that person, but at the same time, find the middle manager who will give you information, who will help and support, because all of that is about understanding what their real needs are, understanding what the wins are, both for individuals and for the organization. If you don't have that, you're selling into a vacuum. I've, and that's, of course, what I hate today. We've got a great product. 100 phone calls a day. We've got a fantastic product. Click. Right. We've got a fantastic product. Click. Right. People aren't interested in your product. They're only interested in the outcome they might gain by adopting your product. Well, boy, truer words have never been spoken. Nobody buys technology. Yeah. They just buy what it does for them. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And, and, you know, prior to that, Jimmy, you're talking about, hey, you know, I go high, I go low. I'm trying to understand, you know, what's important to these folks. There, there's uh, also a political component to navigating an organization. Yes. Yeah. I think that that leads to this really critical um, topic for today, which is just discovery. Yes. yes. And, you know, how we're going through that process. And, you know, when we're coaching teams today, um, particularly, you know, some, some less mature teams in sales, they, they've got this idea that they've had one person sort of identify a need or a want. They've had some good conversations. And then you ask the question, why exactly would this company make this investment? Yes. And the answer that comes back is really not substantial. They really yes. have no yes. idea whatsoever. So how, when we're talking to the, you know, the folks out there listening today, let's talk about discovery, your thoughts on, first of all, what is it? And then let's talk about executing a discovery and maybe some best practices in your view. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, first of all, if you take discovery, I find that when I look, you know, if I'm looking at LinkedIn and what's out there, there's a mass of stuff about first contact. Yeah. How do you get the first phone call? What do you do? And I, and I do a lot of stuff on that as well. But it's, you know, do you use phone? Do you use LinkedIn? Do, do you do an email? All of that stuff. Right. But let's assume you've made contact. The other mass of content on sales training is at the end. Mm -hmm. How do you negotiate and close? Right. Yeah. For me, the glue is that middle bit. And that's sure. what I generically call discovery. So it's from, you know, a lead comes in from marketing. Hey, right. Oh, fantastic. I've got someone. I'm off. Pick up the phone. Stop. Don't pick up the phone. So, so two separate things that, that I would say initially. The first thing is never, ever make contact until you've researched exactly yes people say people say how much research and the answer is if it was amdal and, and it was today i'd want to know everything about the decision makers before i picked up the phone for the first time i would want to have worked up an org chart if i'm selling something at much lower level it's not two to five million it's uh it's 50k mm -hmm. i would want to know at least if i'm under time pressure from my boss i want to know at least enough so that I don't embarrass myself. Right. I have, uh, you must have this as well. I have had, I have had messages on LinkedIn in this last month from people selling me a vehicle fleet <laughs> and, and sales training. I, I, every people who listen to this podcast, Jim, they've heard me say this all the time for oh. the last X number of episodes. I get cold called at least once a month by a sales training company. So yeah, somebody yeah, who does, yeah. they, so they have not even gone to the website to realize if we're a sales training company, perhaps we would not be buying sales yeah, training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I make it very clear on LinkedIn and my website that I'm a one man business. Yeah. So what use do I have for a vehicle fleet? And, and they're aggressive. <laughs> it's like, yeah. So, so the first thing is don't embarrass yourself. That's the first golden rule, but do as much research as time allows. Now that you know that, and that research is so easy today. In the 70s, you could only, Hard. yeah, you didn't know anything. You could see what was on TV. You could ask for something from their company secretary. That was it. Today, right, if, so the one of the banks that I sold to, which I had great trouble getting any information from, uh, last week I did a search just before I went on a holiday, and I said, 
Royal Bank of Scotland news. Mm. Eight million hits. Don't anybody tell me you can't find out information about oh, yeah. the prospect that you're going to go to. So number one, do that and do it and say, what world are they in? Are they growing? Are they consolidating? What's their world like? And what are their challenges? The second thing to do is be before you even get to the, you know, to, to that point, you really need to be saying to yourself, do I have a solution? Is there something here that's going to work? And a great way to think of this is, I often say to people, if I'm training or helping a group, I'll say, do you have a sales process? Now, because of the, maybe 10, 15 years ago, the answer to that might have been a bit gray, but because of CRMs, mm -hmm. stage one, <clears throat> stage two, stage three, stage four, the stage has a name, the stage has a score. Everybody, everybody says, yes, we've got a sales process. Fantastic. Do you use it? Yes, we do all the time. Even better. And then I say, how often do you ask your prospect what their buying process is? Mm. And there's always silence. <laughs> you know, if I was trying to sell to somebody and I had to choose between my formal sales process and their buying process, I know which of the two I'd be going with. And it wouldn't right. be my sales process. I would be doing what they want. Right. So before you even engage, there's this whole thing around knowing and understanding through research and then asking them how they like to buy, what they like to do. So that, that's the first thing. Then, of course, you start to get into discovery itself. And that's all about questioning and listening. Um, I, I despair. I, as I say, I was so lucky to have that training from, from Olivetti. But that training in the 70s was all about understanding what the customer's priorities are and what their needs are. So yeah. all the way back there, that old, that ancient, no such thing as email, no such thing as the internet. They had the idea and they had it right. And I, I really despair today when I hear people saying, yeah, I'll do the introduction and then the pitch. Mm. So, oh, please, please, no. They're only, if, if they give you time, it's only because they might have an interest and the interest is in the outcome. And the outcome is either to help them with an opportunity or to help them deal with a challenge or a problem. Yes. You have to understand what that is and what the pecking order is. That's the most important thing for us. That's the second, that's the third. Once you know that, you tune what you do towards them. Wow, yeah. Jim, so many great, well, three really great things to, to unpack there, I think. I think you, you know, you've talked about research, you talked about the buying process, not just our sales process, and then you, you brought up this kind of terrible word, word of pitching, which I hope somehow gets removed Please. from the vocabulary yes. of yes. salespeople. And I've heard, you know, other sort of less, you know, less cordial ways of referring to it, but we, we have stopped wasting people's time. Nobody yes. cares yes. about you and your product and your offering. It's, it's only what it's going to do for them. Uh, let, let's unpack a few of these things because I think they're so critical yeah. and they also lead to discovery. Yes. And, um, you know, reading your books, I know you're so well read yourself and I love the quotes from other folks, but the, the research, um, I, think, I think as you aptly point out today, th there is no excuse for not intimately knowing at a minimum, regardless yes. of how small the offering is that you're uh, that, that your company provides, I always like to look at it and just say, listen, I have to really understand the person. I have to understand their company and their industry. And then I want to find that point of interest. So, yes, yes. you know, there's a lot about first contact and how do I get through? But yes. I think if we do that, you know, with discipline, then, you know, we're, we're kind of playing on the old, uh, the Robert Cialdini Maybe yes. a book you remember from Influence from your marketing days, you know, Absolutely. your marketing certification. Yeah. Yeah. You're playing on that theory of reciprocity when we've done research and we can communicate that. They go, okay, well, maybe this person has earned a little bit of my time and attention. Yes, you know? yes. And then they have, I love the way you put it, what would you do? A point of view. Yes. We're not pitching, but at least I have a point of view as to why yes. I'm calling. yes. So, so I, I think that one's so critical team out there. And, and by the way, you know, if you're in an industry where, um, you know, your offering is not an, an expensive offering, this is not, 
you know, hours worth of research, the three things we just pulled up, we actually coach in our workshops on, you know, there's five to 10 minutes worth of work. Yes, yes. I would agree entirely. This is not, this is not a big job. Yeah. You know, today, website or LinkedIn, or if it's a small business, Facebook. Yeah. Right. What's their style? What's their approach? Who are the people? And then I, I add to that, I, you know, let's say it's a bank in the UK. I'll just, I'll just go onto Google and go banking priorities UK. Yeah. And up will come three or four learned articles saying the biggest challenges for banks today are one, two, three. Thank you. Yes. I'm now a domain expert, or, or at least I am for the very first part of the conversation, because there's nothing worse than that introduction being, hi, I'm Jim, and I've got a great product. Right. Who cares? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jim. I've been following your organization for a few months and I've noticed your movement in this space and that space. Right. And I'm guessing you're responding to the challenge that all the banks have got, which is this. Right. Well, yes, you're right. Conversation. That's all you're looking for in that first opening comment is the ability to potentially offer value so that the conversation moves forward. And that then leads into discovery. Awesome. And, and so let's play it out even a little bit further here. So, yeah. so let's say we've got folks now, they're the next gym selling into British Telecom. They're selling yeah. uh, a CRM system. They're sell selling uh, an administration ERP system into British Telecom. The reality of it is, would we go about it differently? Slightly, yes. So we'd still mm -hmm. do all of those things, but then we're gonna go take a look at their annual report or, yes. or yeah. you know, for those in the US listening, the 10K report, which at times to somebody who's new in sales might look like an intimidating document. The annual yes. report could be 140 pages, 150 pages long. What we always like to remind people is the 150 pages annual report has about 15 pages of explanation and the rest are financial models yes. for the P&L, the statement of cash flows and the balance sheet yeah. by division, by geography, by product. Yeah. So, None of that really matters because the chairman and the president will both summarize what's happening in their three or four page summary that's written so that someone in grade nine can understand it. Yes, I, you'll, have, you'll have seen me laughing there. I'm laughing because that's the first thing I teach in the, in the UK. Oh, is that right? And oh, here, awesome. It, hey, we got to partner up. Maybe, we yeah, be, maybe I, I can be your, your uh, North American correspondent. Absolutely, because because in the in the UK, when I talk about research, I talk about Google. I talk about we have a fantastic facility. You can go to the UK government's company's house register online, free, and go to the annual report without having to search their website. And I say to people in the UK, look at the chairman's statement and the MD, the managing director statement, exactly the same thing. And they are about what's happened to them in the last year. What's their environment like and what are they trying to achieve this year? And it often has things like Project Platinum or our goals for 2025. Where are right. we going? Our three-year plan. That, And you then go, right, that's where they're going as an organization. That's the two leaders of the organization. And then you're off and running. And that's mm -hmm. only a few minutes. Really are. And we, we, you know, one of just a very tactical example. Love it, Jim. Um, you know, we'll often look at some of those annual reports where uh, a company has acquired a couple of other different companies, and yes. one of their top initiatives is integrating and uh, developing their talent, training yes. their yes. team. So yeah. when our team reaches out, they reference that and say, listen, you're obviously interested in investing and in training and developing your people. Yep. You know, that's why I'm reaching out, because yes. we're, yes. we're a sales training company. So, so let's continue on. So you, you do that research, by the way, and, and maybe we're earning the right to proceed yes, with a decent yeah. conversation. Yes. And by the way, that conversation, if you can, if you can't, the start you've got is already better than I've got a great product. Oh, of course. If you can, if you can, then the thing to do is to mention an outcome. Mm -hmm. Yes, we've already worked with Midland Bank, and here are some of the results that we got. I thought that might be of interest to you. So in other words, here's a comparison and here's a specific. Yeah. And once you've got that, then the, the odds at each step, not going with product, going with their world, giving an example, 
And then if you can give an outcome from that example, takes you way up the scale in terms of the likelihood of them carrying on. Oh, fantastic. So, so let's, let's assume we're into, you know, some of these, these are not, you know, single conversation cell cycles. Yes. You know, we're, we're, it's not a massive hundred million dollar deal, but it's, it's also not a $5,000 deal. Yeah. Yeah. Let's start to talk about discovery. So, so if we've earned, you know, hopefully we've earned that right to proceed. Yes. You know, tell us a little bit about the importance of discovery, what we're trying to do, you know, in a complex cell cycle, when there's multiple people who influence it, how we execute that with multiple different people. Some of your thoughts there, Jim, because I, I really think this is a gap in selling today. Yes, I, yes. And, and that's one that I consistently and consciously address, because I do think it's a gap. First of all, people think they've got the one contact, and that's great. That one person could be a tire kicker. That one person could be scouting for the opposition. That happened to me every time going against IBM. For sure. One of the friendliest contacts was just trying to find out what it was I was saying so they could feedback. Um, So so first of all, and something I do to this day is I think, you know, let's let's say I'm selling to a medium-sized manufacturing company and uh, it's not my services. I'm working, helping a client do this. First thing is, right, who would your normal con- point of contact be? Oh, well, that would be the process manager. Right, okay, fine. Where do they sit in the organization? No mm-hmm. idea. Create a blank organization chart and say, who else would be in there? Well, it would have to be someone from finance in this project. It would have to be someone from procurement. Oh, of course, it'd have to be someone from IT and support. Right, who are they? And that then gives you guidance for the questions that you ask in order yeah. to understand. And of course, you can then have a guess at what their wins would be. Yes. You know, easy life, project success, meeting financial targets, whatever it is, it will be different for, for each of them. But then, of course, what you do is say, you know, and you always have to give that first person credit. And I, and I would use phrases like, I understand that you're absolutely key to this whole project, but who else might be helping you? Yeah. yeah. So you're not saying you're of no interest, get me the real <laughs> person. You're saying who, who would it be? And then you ask for an introduction. So you get a warm introduction and you start to work your way through the organization. You fill in the organization chart, you understand their wins. And then with each of those individuals, you're going into questioning. Mm-hmm. And questioning, I think, is the single most important core value in sales. So if you don't ask questions, you don't get anything. But the problem in sales is people either pitch don't ask a question or they ask a basic question how many depots do you have oh we have six Mm. great no stop for a second you've got six depots oh is that hard to manage oh gee the communication problems are ridiculous and we've got this problem and that problem oh gee and and what does that mean for you as a business oh well we want you to open two more but our systems won't support that Wow, what's that going to cost you in revenue? So what you're doing is you're going from a statement of fact, we've got six warehouses, down to what's the problem and is it an important problem? And I just rotate that all of the time and teach people to do that in order to get to the reality of what the problem is and what it is that might be of interest. And then, by the way, if I've got a piece of software, let's say it's ERP and it can do 40 things, and they have got massive problems in three of them. Mm-hmm. As a salesperson, I couldn't care less about 37. I'm now only selling three elements. And I'm reinforcing those elements. And I'm demonstrating those elements. And I'm doing a proposal based on those elements. Yes. And the likely outcomes against those. You only address this idea of demonstrating everything, proposing everything, and hoping that some of it sticks against the wall is just so bad. And by the way, buyers hate it. Right. They really dislike that. Just on that one, everybody out there can maybe relate to this. The reality of it is most of us use, you know, Excel. And we use about 3% of the functionality of Excel. Yes. So there's a couple of finance folks out there will be explaining how to use Solver and all these things. The the, The capabilities of Excel would blow your mind. Yes. Oh, yes. However, we use about 3% of it. Most of us are doing spreadsheets. We're doing P&Ls with Excel. Yeah. yeah. Let's go back and, and uh, continue on with, because I think you, you brought some great things up there, Jim, to build on. So, you know, the questioning. 
So, so in, in a discovery today, I think the, the other thing that seems to be a bit of a challenge, we feel like we're in such a rush Yes, and we maybe have been coached on three or four template questions that overtly identify pain that our solution immediately solves for. Yes, yes. And, and then we can't wait to spike the ball and start pitching again. Oh, you yes. got that pain. And so yeah. we don't really a, understand why these things are important to this person. How do they tie to the, the desired outcomes that they have a bu- as a business? Yes, How do those yes. desired outcomes translate down to this person's area or division or metrics and KPI on how they're measured. Mm -hmm. And, and so we're all in such a rush to run through, as you said, at the beginning, we have this little process, we start it, and then we can't wait to get a proposal in front of somebody because the second I send the proposal, now I can update CRM and go, my funnel just got bigger. Yeah, and I've moved a step forward. I'm so excited. Moved, according yeah. to Salesforce, according to HubSpot, I'm closer to a sale, and yeah. it's a complete joke. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. Well, you, if if you're part way, if you've had a look at my first book, one of the things that it's been a bone of contention for me since the CRM started to arrive, and of course they were big, big money in the early instance, and only the biggest organisation took them, and then now there are free variants, etc. But the one thing that none of them do, and I would challenge anyone out there to say, oh, yes, there is one, because I've not found one yet, is the concept of ratios. So the standard reporting I've never seen. So, so I get a lead from marketing, so a marketing qualified lead. Mm-hmm. How many marketing qualified leads does it take to get a sales qualified leads mm-hmm. lead? How many sales qualified leads do I need to get one going into discovery? And you yeah. go down the steps with that. Those ratios... When, when accumulated, tell you how many marketing leads you need to get a sale. And the ratio will typically be something like 20 to 1 or some number like that. Yeah. But knowing that, you can then work and tune your processes. If you're halfway through in discovery and only one in discovery out of three goes to proposal, mm-hmm. if you can just make that two out of three, you've just doubled your revenue. Yes. And that's by tuning your discussion. And it applies to every step that you're going through. So none of them do that as standard reporting. That's the gold that's hidden inside a CRM because that's telling you how you're doing and is it getting better or worse? But, but yes, this, this whole idea of digging beyond the first question. I've got an answer, great. And, and by the way, when I watch salespeople doing role plays, the other thing that I notice is what salespeople tend to do is they ask a question and maybe it's a great question. Are they listening to the answer? The answer is no. They're trying to think what the next question will be. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what? Go into a childlike state, and this is something that I also teach. Someone asks a question. Take a breath. Someone answers your question. Take a breath. Think about it. And then do the thing that children do, young children do. Why? I know. Or what? Or whatever. And they go, well, what I mean is, and they start to give you more information. And you say, oh, and is that a problem? Mm -hmm. Is that difficult? You know, you do those things and it becomes a human conversation, not a sales conversation. We ask those questions all day, every day with family and friends. We come into the office to sell and we switch off that part of our brain. Yeah. And it's a disaster. You want to do the human thing and go, oh, that must be difficult. And that's where you start to get into what the real problems are, what the priorities are, what they're trying to achieve. And that opens the thing up. Uh, so, so that, that there's a, I think a big difference between these questions. There's, you know, where I ask a question because I'm trying to lead them down a path where they answer something oh, the process. that immediately helps me. And yes. so the, the problem with that is while I ask the question, it's not sincere and authentic. And then while they're answering, I am literally tripping over them to give my, oh, perfect, you know, because you need a new blazer? Great. Yeah. Oh, I've I've got one of those. I've got a blazer. We've got five blazers. Man, they look good. So, so, and they're not, they're not authentic. And this is, by the way, what buyers just can't stamp. Yes. This is why, according to, I'll get this wrong. It's either, I think it's Gardner just released something where it talked about the amount of you talked about the buyer's journey and what they do and 
let's first identify a problem, look at some solutions, build some requirements, select a vendor. But, but during that journey, they're going all over the place. It's not serial yes. and linear. And, but apparently they're only spending about 17% of that time with salespeople. Yeah, well, I would say that's probably quite high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't want to keep going through this thing where, okay, you're dragging me through this process. Yeah. The, the approach, again, this, this common sense revolution that's coming in sales is have a conversation, but only if you, if you're, you, you mentioned children, you have to be intellectually curious yes. about the answers. Yes, yes. You know, and, and, and they, they know, they know, and they feel that. Um, one of my third book, as you know, well, I, I had done two books and I decided I wanted to do a third, but I wanted to make it very different. So I ended up with 10 chapters of mine and then 26 short chapters from people who have a real voice in something. Yeah. One of them is a guy called Mark Schenkius from Holland. He was a very senior buyer for a very large corporate for many years. Mm. And he's written a book, which was how I, I came to know him called The Other Side of Sales. And if great you idea, to, by his, the way. His, what a sorry. great idea for a book. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. by the way, he his book is called, um, what was it? Uh, it's something like The Nightmare. <laughs> and, and what he does is he talks about, um, he's been running a process to buy something and it's the day that he's about to get all the vendors, the shortlisted vendors in, and he goes through his day. And as a salesperson, you're sitting there and he's going, the first ones arrive and they're five minutes late and they can't connect to the projector and they say, oh, this has never happened before. And you listen to this going, oh, <laughs> nice. I've said that. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then he says, they start to talk and you realize they're not addressing the three questions that you've asked them. And he goes through this thing and every salesperson reading it, if they're honest, will go tick, tick. No kidding. Tick. No oh, kidding. Yeah. You go, oh, and it's so painful to read, but so educational. We don't think about what they're looking for. We don't think about, it. do they want to be asked? Oh yeah, here comes a question. Now things like if you're qualifying, you know, things like Bant or whatever, you know, I, I've worked with people who said, oh, yeah, I asked four questions. What's your budget? Do you have the authority? It's like, oh, no, no, no. Bant itself, as a principle, is very worthwhile. Mm -hmm. But that has to be in the context of, an uh, of a conversation. So it's not, do you have the authority? It's 10 minutes in. So are you doing all this yourself or are there other people involved? You know, right. and so that people have taken a very mechanical approach to questioning, to qualifying, and people just don't engage with that as humans. They go, no, 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 I'm being sucked here so that they can get the answers, so that they can decide what they're going to do next. And that just doesn't feel right, and that, that's what happens. We, we all avoid any form of manipulation. Lots of research has been done on this, where we, yeah. if we feel like you're cajoling me or leading me down a path, or immediately a wall goes up, Yes. And, and I agree with you, Jim, in terms of, you know, there's basic, you know, there's some qualification and there's things we need as salespeople, you know, an intelligent approach to doing yes. this so that we understand, yes. you know, um, whether what we're talking about here is re real and compelling. But it, it can't be in the first conversation. The, the first conversation, I think, has to be about we have to be engaging with prospects where maybe we're sharing some thoughts or insight or wisdom. Yes about a better opportunity for them that they're not yes. they're not aware yes. of you you used the references earlier about you know reaching out to a large bank but speaking about some of the great things we've done to another bank with yes. with another yes. bank yeah absolutely and, and you know what i would actually go even a stage further that 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 for me is the is one of the base points of good selling yes so you're referring them to outcomes that similar people have had but I go further and I actually talk about a principle called adding value outside of the sale. Yes. So Tell where you've got that. no agenda or no win, say, uh, you know, again, you know, not many people sell to big banks. Let's say it's a medium sized manufacturing company. Just say, you know, I was reading in manufacturing today about this trend towards doing X. And I thought, you know, nothing to do with us, but I thought that might be something helpful. I can send you that article if you'd like. Absolutely. Now you're a human being who's offering to help without yes. a, a result coming back to you. And that, that again, 
relaxes them. It's what I would call anti-sales. And you yeah. know, and and you're the uh, second person I've heard somebody reference this anti-sales. I'd like to team up with you guys and call it. This actually is what great sales is. Yes, yes, that's right. It's not about as we've said, pitch go, pitch go. It's oh. about let's talk about your problems. Let's talk about. And I saw this the other day, and I thought about you. Yeah, it's all about that connection and understanding and wanting to help. You know, um, I had I had Dan Pink on the podcast last week. Yes, and and he's written a bunch of people a bunch of nice great books. One of them is my favorite, uh, or one of my favorites called "To Sell as Human." Older yes. book, but great. But he writes on lots of different topics. And I asked them a question. I said, "What are you seeing in professional sales today?" Because he's now, you know, he does uh, workshops and everything like we do. And he came back and he said, "Today, sales is management consulting." All the tactical stuff, small and stuff, a lot of that, you know, might go the way of technology in the future and bots in the yes. future. But, but what will never go that way is our ability to get in and have a, a conversation and help somebody actually identify a problem they didn't know they had or yes. one that might be yes. coming down the road or provide some insight and guidance in terms of something positive that can happen. Yes. But it's, it's management consulting. And I, I think these, I think, you know, the more conversations that we have with buyers, you know, where, where at the end of it, they, they don't have an answer to the question we ask. They just go, man, that's a really good question. Yes. Yeah, that's right. You know, and just being sincere and authentic, a lot of times we'll have a conversation. Somebody's coming to us and saying, Hey, we need sales training. We've got X number of people, 50 people, hundred people, and start talking about this, is where we've got problems with the sales organization. And I'll come back and say, I might ask a question and say, well, listen, you've got lots of priorities as a business. When your CFO asks you, you know, what's the return on investment we're going to get for this sales training? Yes. What are you going to tell her? Yes. yes. And somebody goes, you know, it's kind of a good answer. It's a good question. I have no idea. Yeah. yeah. They told me to go and investigate you know, options. And I said, okay, well, well, I think we should think about that. Mm -hmm. How yeah. actually does this help? How does this help you run a better business? I think if we, you know, and sometimes people are afraid of asking those kinds of questions because it might determine that that client or prospect doesn't need the product or service that you're talking about. That's what yes. might come out of it. Mm -hmm. They're going to get there anyway. Yes, of you know, course they are. Yes. Yeah. So, so why not have this great conversation? Say, well, let's think about it. And they might come back and say, well, listen, Mark, how has, how have other companies like us cost justified this in the past? Yes. And, and you know what? The thing that makes me happy, as I say, I, I, I help literally pre-revenue startups all the way through to scaling companies. Yeah. And one thing that warms my heart, I had one not, not uh, two months ago say, in an event that I was running, we grew 100% last year thanks to the coaching and process and understanding wow. that we gained. You know, bang. Yeah. So, you know, so where it's, and again, in wow. the context of the conversation you're talking about, you can say, well, I can't guarantee anything, but here's what a recent client said. Right. Yeah. So, you know, that, that, and if you can then get an ROI, said typically this is what happens then you're in a very strong position. Because again, even in our world in sales training, most people won't refer to that. Yeah. They'll talk about being better, knowing more, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's such a key point, Jim. And I, th I also find, you know, even with some buying teams, um, they're having difficulty making sense of this purchasing decision. If you do sell something significant, a few hundred thousand yeah. bucks or whatever it is, they don't make these kinds of decisions for your product or service every day, typically. No. Sometimes, no. you know, these, these things might be every three years. They might be every five years. They're getting blasted with information. So, so there's more information out there. They're not better informed. They're more informed. Informed, yes, yes. But, but, you know, they're overwhelmed with everything they're getting digitally. They're getting pounded with spam through LinkedIn. They're trying to figure out how do we actually, first of all, make the right decision, but how do we even think about this problem? How do yes. we make a decision? And this is where I think that the true opportunity in sales today is because I don't think this is done 
This is not done consistently across the board. Yes. Help yeah. them figure all of this out. You know, yes. here are the things maybe you should think about. Even if the answers to those things indicate they don't need us, we're still better off. Yes. Because we're yes. in this process of trying to help. And uh, for those yeah. listening, a guy named Brent Adamson is, it was published in the Harvard Business Review last month. And he, he's actually put a name to this. He works with Gardner now. But 10 years ago, he was one of the two guys who wrote the Challenger sale. With All right, Dixon. okay. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but he, you know, he's with Gardner and he does it. And he's actually coined the term sense-making in sales, or Gardner has. And it's just this thing we've been going through for years and years and years where you see it on major transactions where they're just completely lost. Like, how do I make that decision back in the day to replace an, a mainframe? They have no idea because they're only going to do it once every eight years. Yes, yes. But, but even now on these other transactions, they have no idea to think through or cost justify yes, yes. or look at things. And I, I think this is why discovery is so important. But as long yes. as every meeting, we're just adding value, like they go, yes, wow. Yes, yes. And, and, and here's the thing. For all of those who are listening and who live, as I guess 100% do, in a competitive world, if you've got five competitors, four are pitching, hmm. one is asking factual questions, how many locations do you have? And you're having both a business and a human conversation about their problems, their needs, their priorities, who do you think they're going to turn to first? You know, it's not, it's not, not a difficult question. Yet we tend to ignore that. The fact is, if you become an enabler and a helper, if you say, and by the way, if you allow um, uh, the idea of the off-ramp, look, it looks like this isn't a match, but here's where we are, here's what we can do. Do you know what? Those people come back to you four years later and say, now we need this and we remember you. Because you're the guys that didn't try to get the wrong thing for us. You're the guys, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think that that whole attitude of being common sense, being human and being open with a view to adding value is really the key to this whole discovery process. And the discovery process ends as you're proposing and presenting and starting into negotiation and closing. And, and by the way, Aside on that, I was taught in Olivetti about 10 closes, what we call the Winston Churchill close, the assumptive close, <laughs> all of this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I now in my business, my goal is not to close. My they goal close. is it's just the next step. Yeah. Because they're going, yeah, this is what we need to do. What do we do next? Well, right. there's a bit of paperwork, but now we need to look at timings, etc. So I actually aim not to close and I ignore that side of it. Jim, just fantastic stuff. And Jim, by the way, I know, I know we've got a couple minutes left here, maximum. You and I'd be talking about this three hours from now, but you're, yes. you're, you're battling, cause this is just great fun. You're battling, um, uh, jet lag. And we're so appreciative that you, you took, uh, took a meeting with us here today, the oh, day after your vacation. Too. We'll talk again, Jim, for sure. Cause this has just been a pleasure, but um, people listening are going to want to get in contact with you, Jim. Yes. How do they get in contact with you? Uh, we're certainly going to have links to all three books on, yeah. uh, on the podcast notes, but how do they get in touch with you? Okay, the easiest way and the way that I use most frequently is LinkedIn. I do a lot of work on LinkedIn, and it's just Jim Irving. And if you look for me, you'll see there's only a, there's a, only a very few and I'm the one that writes books and is up there as an author and a coach. So very straightforward. I've also got a website, uh, b2bsellingguidebook.com. That's the, the first book of the three. So yeah. very easy to make contact. And I love chatting to people and adding value, whether or not anything comes from it, as you'll have gathered. Yeah. So, thank you, um, Jim. So team, three great books, all great reads. Uh, the B2B Selling Guidebook. Uh, was uh, awarded the best new books by Book Authority, best new books for, by Book Authority. Then the B2B Leader's Guidebook, the B2B Leader's Guidebook, also a great book for those sales managers and those sales leaders. And then the third book, which Jim referenced today, the B2B Sales Top Tip Guidebooks. What an interesting approach Jim takes where he goes to other thought leaders 
like the gentleman in purchasing we discussed to get them to write their insights in a chapter. Really interesting read. Uh, look to see Jim on another podcast within the funnel because this was such great fun. Uh, so thank you all for joining the Selling Well podcast today. And if you like what you heard, like and subscribe to the podcast. We'd really appreciate that. And by the way, if there's something we can do to add even more value to you, let me know. You can email me personally at markcox at inthefunnel.com, markcox at inthefunnel.com. Let us know how we continue to add value to you most through the Selling Well podcast and good selling to everybody.